Hey everyone, this is Grandmaster Magesh Panchanathan. Welcome to the Proches training course on strategic thinking. This is going to be the foundational basic strategic thinking course. And I've been floating around with this idea for quite some time. I'm super happy that I'm out with it. And, you know, let's jump right into it. The first thing in this video, the introduction video is going to be about what you can expect from this course. What are we learning and how are we learning it? So let's start with the definition. What is strategic thinking and how are we going to define it for this course purposes? The classifications are simple. Uh, dynamic thinking and strategic thinking are two main ways that we will classify, you know, chess positions. The, the main difference being short term and long term, right? Dynamic thinking is more about what's going on right now. And strategic thinking is about what's going to happen in 5, 10, and 15 moves. So when you come up with these long-term plans, how can you still make them make it with proper sense and relevance? That's what this course is going to be about. Uh, for example, if you take, let's say, your opponent king, opponent's king is not castled, you're not going to be trying to make a 15-move plan around it, right? Because it doesn't make sense. They might just not have the king out there at that point. You, uh, they might have castled by then and your whole plan will collapse. The same way, uh, so in that case, you will try to do something immediately. So that's why it's dynamic thinking. You're going to calculate something. You're going to try to make use of your king's uncastled king right away. On the other hand, if the king is uh, castled and everything, but let's say your opponent has double pawns, you can definitely make some long-term plan around it because the pawns are not going to automatically undouble. They're going to stay there for 10 moves, right? The only thing is if you capture something, there's a possibility that the pawns can get undoubled, right? But it only happened with your capture. So you can count on that and make a long-term plan. Uh, typically, this is the distinction between the short-term and long-term thinking. And in this course, we will be focusing mainly on the long-term thinking in strategic thinking, but we will also talk about dynamic thinking and dynamic positions quite a bit because chess is very, you know, um, dynamic. It, it keeps changing. Right, the the nature of the position keeps changing. Your opponent might make a move, or you might make a move, and the nature of the position can quickly flip from strategic to dynamic or dynamic to strategic. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're aware of the nature of the position at all times, and we will be doing that in this course as well. Now, before we jump into the details um, um, of what we are learning and how we are learning, I would like to give one analogy that I love, and I it helps me understand how. Um, you know, strategic think, thinking falls in place in terms of, um, you know, how we're thinking about chess. Imagine you're riding a bicycle to a destination, right? Riding the bicycle itself, meaning the technical aspects of, you know, riding the bicycle, like uh, pedaling, you know, keeping the bicycle in balance, being able to turn the handle so you can switch directions and go different ways. All of this is actually the dynamic part of the game. If you don't know this, you can't go 10 feet without crashing. So you have to be able to balance the bike. You have to be able to pedal, right? So if you don't, in, in comparison in chess, it's if you don't, if you cannot handle tactics, if you cannot handle calculation, you're going to fall and crash, right? Way quickly. So you won't be able to make any 10 move plans. You won't be able to do anything long term. So when we start, most of us start learning the game, the first thing we do is do calculation. We do a lot of tactics. We do a lot of this practice because that's what helps you get to a point where your bicycle is stable, your game is stable. Then you can go on to do other things like planning and strategizing, right? So the next part is, let's say you do reach a point where you're able to ride the bike in a reasonable way and you don't fall. What is the next question? Like, where are you going? What is your destination? This is extremely important. And this is where I do get a lot of people or my students and a lot of friends asking question about how do I come up with a plan? And that's what this course is going to address. What will you do once you get past that initial level where there are no tactical mistakes? Obviously, everyone makes tactical mistakes. But as you go stronger and stronger, the number of mistakes go down. So initially, you can think about winning a game because your opponent may have messed up somewhere. But at some point in your career, you will reach a point where your opponent is not messing up tactically. The only way to beat them is to beat them through, you know, strategic kind of positional uh, nuances. And that's what, again, we'll focus on this course. Now, 
we'll move on to what we'll be focusing on to try to come up with these plans and long term goals that is pawn structure hopefully you you've all learned about that a little bit at least and you know why it's important if not you will be learning a lot about it in this course right why are pawn structures so important pawn structures you know it tells you what to do and what not to do it's like your skeleton right you cannot move you know away from or against the motion that's defined by your skeleton so if you try to do that you're going to most likely break a bone and we don't want that and you should listen to your pawn structure you have to pay attention to the key features which we will learn in this course to try to come up with these long term goals right again the reason why we should look at pawns is very simple and important for you to know it is it's hard to kind of create a target that's moving like right? you know hard to shoot at a target that's moving imagine throwing a dart at a swinging board it's much more challenging for you to do that than to to, to throw that at a at a stationary board right i don't know about you but for me the chances will go up quite a bit when when the board is not moving not that i'm good at throwing a dart when the board is stationary but in any case you know the importance of trying to create some kind of a goal on a stationary target not on a moving target pieces move around a lot you cannot expect them to be in the same square 5 10 or 15 moves around pawns on the other hand are the most immobile pieces on the board right they don't move much particularly the fixed pawns and the pawns that are least likely to move those are the pawns i want you to pay attention to those are the pawns that's going to tell you information about the position that you can kind of make a meaningful sense and a plan with it so we will be talking about pawn structures to come up with all these observations and important factors and throughout the course we will be doing that and hopefully you will be able to get the essence of pawn structures through this course now the next two things that i want to talk about are how we are going to learn what we are going to learn in this course so we have something that we i will be talking about in this course extensively again is called that is called domination scenarios and i'm going to coin the term doms only because i don't want to say domination scenarios a million times doms is very simple in any given position i just want you to be aware of the domination scenarios in which you or your opponent will strategically dominate your other like person so you can dominate your opponent or your opponent dominates you to start with i'm going to tell you all the positions we will look at in this exam in this in this course will start with some kind of a balance it won't be that one person is crushing the other person most of the time you will start with some balance and you will see that somebody is tipping that balance one side or the other right now what do we establish by by doing doms well you're basically being aware that's what happens when you know that what your boundaries are right if you know that in a certain position you do not want to trade a bishop like an open position bishops are better than knights we don't want to trade a bishop for a knight in an open position this is a guideline that we set ourselves because in most positions in strategic points this is true sometimes of course you will give up your bishop for a knight for a dynamic reason but mostly not for a strategic reason right but there are always exceptions but the rule still stands and this rule gives you some kind of guideline or boundary in your games now when you look at the pawn structure and you come up with these boundaries it's it helps you from going off road right it's okay to sway because you imagine you're driving in a road you can change lanes that's fine so you have multiple possible ways to go to your destination but you cannot go off road otherwise you're going to crash and burn doms are going to help you establish that boundary right being aware right a lot of you are aware of tactical scenarios in tactical places you're like mm i can see a checkmate coming up a possible checkmate idea coming up in three or four moves i can see a possible pin or skewer coming up and you anticipate this long before it happens when it when your opponent actually makes this mistake you can jump on it because you've been looking for it right the same way i want you to have positional anticipation i want you to look at something and say these are my boundaries and when i know these boundaries when they go wrong i can quickly catch on to them now the last thing and the most important thing in this course is that we will be learning mainly by learning what not to do not by learning what to do right i know that sounds a little counterintuitive but the goal of this course is to establish the rules within which you can operate 
I'm not going to be picky about what move you should play in a position because I think there are lots of options. And I think you should have the option to pick which way you want to go, right? But you have to know what the boundaries are and what you cannot cross. So we will look at games in this course specifically between for players between like 1500 to like 2600 rating. So quite a huge range. And typically I've picked examples where, you know, there's a rating gap about 300, 400 points. So you're going to look at someone dominating the other person. It's easier when there's a rating gap. And that's the reason I specifically picked games like that, um, where one person sees what's coming long before the other person. So that's where the position domination usually happens. So when you when you look at these examples and you see what kind of mistakes that they're doing, you're hopefully going to see that, oh, I was not supposed to cross this boundary and I crossed it, right? So you're going to look at this from the perspective of the person who's making the mistake, not the perspective of a person who's trying to exploit it, right? So you're learning your boundaries and to stay within that. And that's how this course is going to be built. Hopefully you have a good idea of what we are going to do um, and how we are going to do a little bit in this one. I do have a couple of examples to show you before we jump into our actual course. But before that, I want to show, talk to you a little bit about the thinking process, which is very simple and straightforward, yet um, very much necessary for how we are going to progress. So let's look through the thinking process. This is a basic step, but we're going to rinse and repeat this multiple times so you get this ingrained in your head, right? First, never start doing anything in a position before you observe it. Pay attention to what's going on. Do not try to come up with a plan or a move or a variation, which I see from my students all the time. Always start by observing. And what are you looking for? We kind of talked about it in the previous slide. I want you to look for any information that's valuable in the long term. Remember, we are also going to look at short term stuff. It's just that we're not talking about that in this course. In this course, we are only defining our goal is to come up with a long term plan or a strategic plan. So I'm only defining that. Obviously, you should be aware of the dynamic things that's happening in the game. So coming back to our point, we are observing long term things, meaning pawn structure and pawns that are fixed pawns that tell you a story or give you some information. So it could be a lot of things. You talk about space, you know, weak pawns, weak squares, so many things which you'll be going over in this course step by step. The next thing you have to do is once you have these factors, you have looked at maybe five, six observations that might mean something, you have to prioritize them. Some factor is going to say or call for their attention, say, hey, look at me, right? I'm, I'm a backward pawn. I am a double pawn, right? Another one's going to be like, I'm an open file, right? Which one are you going to pick as the most important one? Now, this stage is very important for two reasons. One, this defines the nature of the game. If you pick a short term factor, for example, we talked about early on, if your opponent's king is uncastled and you decide that that's the most important factor, that means you're telling me that the position is more dynamic and you're going to calculate and do something more straightforward there. On the other hand, if you do something, or if you pick a factor that's more about double pawns or backward pawn, then you're telling me that the position is strategic and you're going to come up with plans. So how you're going to think is actually defined by your decision that you're taking on number two, how you're prioritizing the factors. So be very, very you know keen or be very conscious about what you're doing on this stage two, right, in your thinking process. Not only that, you're also going to decide who is better or who's worse. If you picked a factor saying that, you know, the open file that white has is the most important one, then you cannot give me an evaluation that black is better, right? Because that means you're telling me black has something that's more important than the open file that you're not actually paying attention to. So one thing throughout this course that I will be helping you do is be consistent. It's okay to make a mistake because you will learn from your mistakes eventually. But it's important that you're consistent, right? You cannot, you know, pick a key factor that's not in your main observation. In main observation, you have a few factors. Your prioritizing factor has to be picked from that. And once you pick that, your evaluation has to be based on what you picked. The nature of the position has to be based on what you picked. That consistency we are going to learn through this course. Now, once you pick the factor, the next step is to define your goals, meaning DOMS. 
We are going to use our domination scenarios to make sure we are aware what we can and cannot do and over what our opponent can and cannot do, right? Just the boundaries. Can I trade this piece? Can I push this pawn? Can my opponent do that? And what am I trying to achieve, right? Most of the scenarios are usually about just simple pawn trades, um, simple pawn breaks or piece trades. So this is where, again, it's very slow. This is strategic play. You are not going to get something right away. Sometimes you will play long, long games and long, lots of moves to only have sl slight advantage, right? So when you establish the DOMs, what you're essentially seeing is what kind of trades or pawn breaks that's going to favor you, and you're going to set those boundaries. And once the boundary is set, and once we have the, the plan of action to say, hey, to achieve my domination scenario, these are the things I'm going to try to do, the next set is to stay in course. Do not waver because this is also a very important part of this process. I have seen a lot of my students establish some good plans only to get bored in three or four moves or get distracted in three or four moves. Now they see another target and they want to move on because this one is not helping them win the game in five moves, right? So you have to stay the course and until, of course, someone, a move is made where new information is available to you that tells you that the position, the, you know, the dynamics of the position has changed and you want to do something else, right? And just remember, everything that we learn in this class always has an exception. So you're not ever going to be able to say, hey, I learned this rule in this course, that's it, right? Any rule anywhere always has exceptions. We're only kind of learning more of a generic guideline that can help us stay on that course. All right. Now, let's jump into our game, practical examples now, that will help us clearly understand what we are talking about in this course. All right, there you go. The first position that we will be looking at. This was played by one of my students, um, rated around 1700, and his opponent is playing white, is rated around 2,000, 2,100. And um, in this, uh, this was played at the nationals in an elementary nationals a few years ago. Now let's start by following our process. Yeah, I'm going to start with basic observations. Backward pawn, outpost square. I see some space for black on this side. Remember, space is always defined by pawns because pawns are long terms. You know they're going to stay there. This knight usually does not define space. In general, pieces don't define space because they can be kicked out and pushed back. Pawns, on the other hand, can stay their ground, so that's why we define them as space. Of course, we'll go in depth in the chapter where we talk about space to discuss all those things. But what we know from this is that there are three minor pieces on the board for white and black, and black seems to have a bishop pair. So that's a good balance. So we have a nice bishop pair as, as something that's positive for black, and we have this, you know, nice backward pawn and outpost square and this semi-open file for white. What do you think is the key factor? Well, one thing I want to also talk about in this course is whenever I ask a question, anytime, you can always pause, come up with some answer, take some time, come up with some answers and then unpause to see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Hopefully you have decided that the key factor is actually this one. Right, the weak pawn and this outpost square. Now, by picking this, I'm saying that white's better, right? Maybe by a little bit, not by much, but I am saying that I like to play as white because that's what seems to be the most important factor for me. With this in hand, let's decide what our doms are. The domination scenarios for white and for black. Well, for black, what are the boundaries? Hopefully it's pretty straightforward because if this is a bad pawn, you never want that pawn to move up. That weakness has to stay forever. Eventually, you're hoping as white. When I say you are, I'm saying white is hoping to win that pawn, right? So that means that should never move up. If that pawn should never move up, white should always stay in control of d5. Now, white's already doing a great job with that, right? The two pawns are making it almost impossible for black to play d5, but black can still trade the outpost square pieces. Anytime you put a piece on d5 for white, black can capture it. So if white is trying to dominate black, 
white does not want any black piece capturing this outpost piece. So the domination trades are very straightforward. The knight and the bishop are the two pieces that can actually attack this square in the future. Remember, this one never can, right? So we leave that bishop there. So the knight on c6, if let's say it's traded for the knight on c2, and the bishop on c8 traded for the bishop on e2, I would say that is your domination scenario for white. That's how white's going to dominate black with simple trades. Now, the only salvage uh, salvation for black might be if this bishop can somehow manage to get to d4 or c5, right? So again, by establishing these things, we have made so many useful decisions in a game that you don't have to think about. Like this bishop has two routes. I might be able to go around like this. I might be able to go around like this if this pawn ever moves. And white should always watch out for it. Now we have set some boundaries for white too, right? This bishop not to get here or at least not make his life easy to get there. What are the domination scenarios for black? We can kind of reverse it because we, um, I forgot to mention this in our basic observation, there are some nice outpost squares in which black is dominating the dark squares. Remember, white does not have a dark squared bishop. So it looks like I can do the same trade application for white now. If I remove these two knights, which can control the dark squares and leave the bishop on the board and plant either a knight on d4 or a bishop on d4, I might be able to dominate my opponent, right? Preferably a knight. I always like good knight versus bad bishop. And if you get that scenario, then white, again, is in trouble unless white's bishop ends up on d5, which is almost, again, impossible. Uh, there's no clear path for the white bishop to even get there, right? But anyways, now we have the domination scenarios established for both sides. Now let's look at what happened in the game. It's white's turn to play, as you can see. White played bishop to g4. So based on the boundaries we have established, what is it that black can and cannot do? Hopefully you have understood this process now. Black can do a lot of things, but not trade the light squared bishop, right? In the game, black played king h8, allowing the trade with bishop takes c8. And let's see what black could have done to avoid it. Of course, the two obvious moves are bishop to b7 and bishop to a6, right? In which bishop b7 definitely stands out to me because remember in our dream domination scenario or doms, we were thinking how to get rid of this knight and this bishop could be a good piece to do that. And in our doms, this bishop was the least of interest for black to trade because that never is going to guard the d4 square. So trading that does not seem like a good option for me when I think about my doms. So I can also go bishop e6, an interesting way of saying, listen, you cannot trade, right? The point is, if you trade, we're going to change the pawn structure and you'll have to reevaluate the factors and now remember that there is no outpost. And this pawn on e6 is doing a great job of defending those light squares. So black has this uh, option to go to e6, b7, a6, multiple things, but black cannot simply trade the bishops, right? I usually don't use engines as much in analysis, particularly for strategic play, but I'm going to show you here, right, what we are talking about in this particular course. So I'll turn the engine on. Hopefully you can see this. And you see the position is pretty much in balance. It says the position is equal either with bishop e6, bishop b7, bishop a6. This is what I'm talking about when I'm establishing boundaries, right? I'm not going to tell you what the best move in the course is. I'm going to tell you what are the bad moves in this course, right? If you talk to any coach who is trying to teach strategy, they will also tell you the same thing. It's very hard to find position. There's only one best strategic move, right? So that's not the point of you know, this particular course. This course is more about what you cannot do, right? And the reason is, is the reason why you're looking at the Stockfish evaluation right now, where it says you can actually play multiple moves and you're absolutely fine. What you cannot play is a move like King H8 and look at the evaluation. The trade already is ruining the position for black. The same thing happens with Bishop takes G4. The trade already is ruining the position because it's taking white one step closer to the domination scenario. I'm going to close the engine and we are going to continue. In the game, 
King H8 was played, takes takes, and now we got basically uh, the one step closer to the domination scenario that we talked about, right? One piece got traded, and the next piece, black had to eventually trade because that knight is pretty strong. So there you go. We got our domination point. This knight just needs to find a way to get to d5, which would be basically at that point much, much harder for black to deal with, right? Uh, obviously, I won't play knight e3 at any point because that means this trade can help. By the way, even with the, the trade scenario, I think white has another secondary domination scenario where all the major pieces are lined up against the spawn and black has to be in a defensive position. That's also pretty good for um, for white, yeah? Now, white made one small mistake, which I want to show you, is that White played a3 here, a move that kind of we will talk about again a time and again about the concept in this course is that strategic thinking means that you're thinking about long-term stuff, but you cannot ignore the short-term stuff. This move is a mistake because now black gets some dynamic chances. Can you spot it? Hopefully you did. a4. White did not notice this interesting blow. In the game, of course, black did not <laughs> find the move a4. But if a4 is spotted, you can notice what's happening is white's pawn structure is completely getting split. But most importantly, white will end up with a pawn on b2 and maybe even bishop to c1, make it almost impossible to deal with this. And by the time you go in and take either the pawn or the bishop, black can go in and pick up a bunch of pawns. Either black will be better or black um, at least will equalize. So going back, a3 is a great idea, except black should have, I mean, white should have noticed that a4 is coming in, in return, yeah? The best thing to do here would have been just queen d3, followed by a4, and I think, uh, sorry, followed by a3 for white, and it would have been a much simpler advantage, and white is doing great. So throughout the course, again, we'll talk about the points where strategic ideas are good, but sometimes dynamic things take over without going in depth. But in the game, rook b8 was played. And white simply captured, captured, and played rook a4, completely dominating again for white. So, an example, to quickly sum up, had multiple good moves, but the bad move was to trade the light-squared bishop simply without changing the nature of the position. Now let's go on to the next one. And here we see a position, let's flip the board from White's perspective, which is, you know, pretty closed. And we will start with our observation, right? Our main process. An outside pass pawn, a nice backward pawn, and an outpost here for black. So in black is kind of dominating on the queen side. Uh, white, do, white does have amazing space advantage with the d5 pawn. Even the g4 pawn gives more space on the king side. Uh, also, the space advantage seems to make a lot of sense because black has all four minor pieces on the board and you can see that they're stepping on each other, right? Not enough space. So, and then I see some outpost in these two squares, which we talked about. Um, what else can we observe? I think the semi-open file has already been mentioned. And there's a small little pawn chain that's blocking the center, which means the position is closed, which means the bishops are most likely bad. In white's case, this bishop does not seem to have much scope because it's locked in both sides. I could go here and try to attack the b5 pawn, uh, whereas this bishop seems really nice. I have nice diagonal both ways. I'm keeping all the dark squares together on this side. And for black, this knight seems amazing. Is about to jump into c4, whereas this knight looks terrible. Has no way to go to no a5, c5. Even if I go to d8, no um, c6 or e6. So we have understood the position a little bit. Now let's define what the key factor is. The key factor in this position, according to me, would be the pawn on d5, which gives space advantage for white. Remember I told you how defining or prioritizing the factors is what is where people go wrong? And you will notice that in this particular game. We'll talk about it uh, shortly. Hopefully you decided that the pawn was important and the space was important. So what are the doms? Well, for black, the domination scenarios are very straightforward. Trade off the like, um, trade off the minor pieces. The more minor pieces go away, the more 
uh, the easier it is for black to move around, the easier it is for him to attack the one weak ta target that white has, and maybe in the end game use this protected pass pawn. So as we see the pieces vanish, it'll be better for black. What about domination scenarios for white? Well, the good thing is since white is already dominating to some extent, right? White is gaining, have, having extra space and kind of establishing, you know, some problems like black's problems are there. So all white has to do is keep those problems intact. So when you're up, when you feel like you're up, that's the main thing you have to do. Don't trade pieces. Don't let black target this or move forward. Right now, black is not even going to capture it because that knight is hanging, right? So black's best bet is to probably do something like knight c4 and hang around there and try to create some play. White can contain it. If white can contain that, then white should probably be in good shape. Now that we have established all of this, take a second to think about what you think white did here that might have crossed that boundary. Hopefully you guessed it right. My opponent was rated 2200. I was around 2500 at this time. And my opponent is now an international master, a strong player. Ended up playing bishop takes b6. Not a great move. But not because he doesn't know the basic things about strategic play or positional play. He's playing this move because he's kind of prioritizing this move, knight c4, over the bishop trade. Right? He wants the dark squared bishop and he thinks that's not as important as the knight going to c4. He wants a dark squared bishop, but he doesn't want to allow the knight to go to c4. Right? He wants both. So he's prioritizing this over this. And that's what happened with this trade. Unfortunately, that's not the right choice. And again, I'm going to show you with the engine. Let's turn the engine on. You can see... White could play multiple moves. Queen e2, bishop d3, knight d2, rook g1. A lot of more possible moves here for white. And they have, all of them seem to have pretty good advantage. Like, you know, a decisive advantage. Watch what happens after bishop takes b3. Boom. We lose most of it, almost a two-point swing. Right? So again, I'm not going to do this engine analysis in depth just to give you the basic information. Right? Again, you're established right? The doms and what you cannot do. When you break these kind of rules, it becomes hard. Now in this position, it's not so obvious because a lot of you might think that knight c4 is very dangerous and it's a big problem. So why not do the trade? But we trace it back to what we decided as a key factor was. Since space was the key factor. See, if I had decided that this was the key factor, then I would probably play this. And then it would turn out to be the mistake, uh, the mistake would be prioritizing the factors, right? You can trace it back to at which point of the thinking pro process did you make the mistake, right? So let's quickly see what happened in the game after the capture. And you will see how black's position becomes extremely pleasant. So white had to play king g2 to save the pawn. I simply played, um, so I was playing black as I mentioned, I simply improved my pieces going forward, nothing much. Rook a3. The first target was how do I get this knight to a good square, right? So knight d8, f6, knight f7. Knight's in a decent square. The next thing is how do I get the bishop to a good square? Bishop f8. In the meantime, white's offering a queen trade. I decided not to trade queens because I have more options in this position. So I decided to keep that a little bit. And after queen d8, eventually bishop came to h6. I went on to win this game. I'm not going to show you the whole game. You can look through this um, in the PGN when when I uh, when you have the course, but you don't have to see the whole game to understand the point that we are trying to establish up until here. That is that you know to sum it up, we want to say that the starting of this position, White had amazing space advantage, and White was in a plus minus situation, more than one point advantage, and all White had to do is keep that status, not change it, except. Um, once the trade happened, particularly the dark squared bishop, you could not have done that. You should not do that. And when that trade happened, black took over, right? So I hope you enjoyed this introduction video. And remember, we are going to rinse and repeat this process. We'll follow the thinking process. We are also going to time and again establish our boundaries to know what not to do. I will see you in a future chapter.